Okay, so, so it looks like um, if you have a debate, uh, a typical Swedish debate is a debate where everybody agrees, and <laughs> so there, there seems to be uh, perhaps too much of agreement within the panel, so maybe we have to uh, uh, see if we can find some disagreement between sort of the audience and the panel. Um, so uh, to, to, to set this off, I would like to, um, to start with uh, uh, take the point of departure from the first slide that Vasna showed, which was this editorial from Science, where global health is really portrayed as something where people are not in the center, but it's <coughs> the pharmaceutical industry um, and the research by US labs uh, funded by Gates Foundation, perhaps, and that's the ones, that's the machinery that will give us global health. Um, is that sort of, uh, and we have a rather similar view, uh, sort of mainstream view, if we look at agriculture, if we look at agriculture in Africa, in that sort of mainstream view, it seems to be um, AGRA, the, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. Uh, um, they provide sort of the, the, the hardware, the machinery, and is funded by uh, Rockefeller and Gates Foundation. So is this sort of, is this the world, are these the forces that will bring us the future that we want? Or do we need to reconfigure the international scene and put people in the center as sort of the, the, the aim of, of last night's report was. So, so that's sort of the, uh, perhaps uh, the big frame of the debate. Good afternoon, we're going to turn off the... the yes, and save some energy while we're doing so. Excellent intervention. So somebody like to kick off. Oh, now we can see. Oh, that's okay. Don't talk too soon. <laughs> Just like the private sector, it always comes back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, who will save us? Or the planet? <laughs> Ourselves. Yeah. I can start with a question. Yeah? Uh, in the morning. Uh, okay. In the morning, uh, Nick, you <coughs> talked about uh, the role of uh, of the IMF and the World Bank in uh, reducing people's access to some of the resources that have uh, that 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 have been that they used to have prior to the to the structural adjustment programs. Uh, I also read the report, and uh, the IMF and the World Bank were arguing against this report that. Uh, that part of the reason why Ebola was able to uh, to set in and actually spread the way it spread was because the health systems had been so damaged by the structural adjustment programs uh, that they couldn't cope even with the most minimal of uh, challenges, let alone a challenge like uh, Ebola. So uh, this is. A, a, a system that has not been benefiting, I mean, uh, systems in South Saharan Africa in particular, that have not benefited directly from external input, especially when it comes to, to, to challenges like Ebola. But when things are affecting both the developed world, like environmental uh, problems, and the fact too that challenges such as Ebola will not end up in places like South Saharan Africa, do you think that is enough incentive for the developed world to say, okay, well, we are in it together, as you as you put it in the morning. There's no way we can we can we, we can build fences and be safe behind uh, when it comes to challenges, <coughs> environmental and others, uh, health, for example. Is it possible that that could even be a good thing to make change happen? <laughs> Well, let, let me say, e Ebola, of course, uh, was something that, um, that shocked the world, in quotes, because before the outbreak, it was, someone already had a patent to Ebola mm -hmm. in the United States. And some people were already welcomed vaccines for Ebola in the United States. And so 
to me, it was a eureka moment for some people who were investing in Ebola. So it could, there was a breakout, so you could test the drugs and, and do the rest of it. And that is why also when the disease really was ravaging Liberia and Sierra Leone, the U.S. sent troops, and they sent doctors, they sent troops, they sent the Marines. <laughs> so, again, I mean, this, this is exactly the kind of quote that you brought there. The, the epidemics and the challenges in the world today are seen as opportunities, not as problems to be solved. This is disaster capitalism that Norm McLean wrote about in a book, Short Doctrine. You, you, you have a challenge somewhere, then that becomes an opportunity. Climate change is an opportunity to sell <coughs> false solutions, as Hans mentioned earlier in the morning about false geoengineering solutions like ocean fertilization, putting wiping the clouds in the stratosphere and stuff like that, rather than tackling the thing which is stop the emissions as source. Also, say, okay, we can fix everything so that the problem continues. And of course, Africa is a very good experimental ground, guinea pigs, not human beings. And with all polite and very polite now, some people will be happy to have Africa without Africans. Because what is needed is the resources under, under the planet and the soil. And that's just the truth. Yeah. Okay. Maybe, I mean, since he touched on this issue of uh, not solving problem properly, I mean, you know, like on right now this this um, um, the agriculture and climate change so what is being pro promoted is climate smart agriculture although we have already we know exactly that we can deal with organic and agroecology to solve all our problems we need to now again and this is because the world bank and the uh, it's what you call the green fund which uh, they have all the money and so now they say no no we, we we're going to promote a new solution here okay Climate smart agriculture, and if you look what's really in there, it's actually the same old stuff under the new la new label. It is pieces of a holistic approach, which is agroecology. So we take a few <coughs> elements out of it and go, say, oh, don't worry about all this other stuff, too complicated. We're going to solve it again with a few silver bullets. And that's it. It's, so again, you know, this is again something that comes from outside, imposed on the farmers, not only in Africa, but on farmers even, even here and Asia, wherever you go and look. Uh, again, to protect the, the, the present system of large farms, industrial agriculture, heavy, high input um, in terms of machinery, uh, fossil fuel, etc. So I think you, you can see that the same thinking is still there uh, when actually we have very good alternative solutions and we don't need anything new like climate smart agriculture. Uh, I'd like to return to that uh, slide, which I announced Linus. Why don't we see um, the editorial in science that um, people-led sanitation will improve drastically improve the um, uh, the lives of millions of people so that they can start cultivating their field so they can start to uh, improve the productivity of the soil and so forth. Why why don't we see that? Why don't you write it? Why don't you put it there on? on <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are trying to shout loud yeah. uh, to, the, to, to be heard. And I think it's, there's like a turning tide, uh, not least because of Gates, actually, who also has, I think, good intentions. And he, his foundation is, is, is driving, of course, the technology development more than awareness or, or policy or, or you know, co-creating. <coughs> research about the technology development to enable recycling, to enable research conservation. Because the toilet as we know it today is, it has had minimal development since our dark ages. So we're still, a colleague of mine says it's the last chapter of human development is how we confront and manage our own, own waste, which is deplorable. Uh, the best we do is, is disaster minimization. We, you know, in, in the West we can try to flush and forget that we collect uh, and we, we try to avoid uh, spreading pathogens, try to avoid over, um, polluting the environment with nutrients, or water, water bodies with nutrients, but we are not taking that positive course of aligning with the cycles, nutrient cycles, water cycles, and, and energy. We're just like re reducing, minimizing the destruction. 
So what is a pity, I think, is that we're looking at the, the international focus is on the 1 billion who have don't have toilets and on the 2.5 billion who have, like, including those 2.5 billion, the ones who have unimproved toilets, not up to the aesthetical standards that we like. And they are considered to be the problem while we are all actually at least almost the 7.5 billion part of the problem. So, but I think the tide is turning. I mean, and ministers in India were saying, uh, two, two state ministers were, were saying the other week sorry, in the news that they are now fertilizing their, their fruit gardens with, with their own urine. So it's like it's coming up, bubbling up through research, through NGOs, uh, to, to higher levels. So it's, in okay. a couple of years you'll have it in, in the everywhere. <laughs> okay. In the science. <laughs> I, but I think there is, there is a, a really significant issue about these question of, of scaling up and scaling out a number of these initiatives because there is successful projects that are happening at a very small scale yeah. and actually taking it beyond that is, is something almost impossible and then when we try and look at the global scale there are certain groups who have much bigger reach and more powerful reach and, and so you know lots of good ideas, good initiatives get lost somehow <coughs> in the, the discussions. Um, I don't think we've quite got it right in terms of how to scale up and scale out many of these projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I think we it, uh, linked to the waste is not only the human waste, it's also all the animal waste. Mm -hmm. And if we continue to actually import huge amount of of feed and food from outside where we live, you cannot have a balance. No matter what you do with it, you're going to have to export it back where, where the actual the original material comes from. And I think so that's much more complicated. So so I think in that we have to think more holistically. So you don't just take over and with that, the waste or whatever. I think it's really important that we really have a much more holistic approach. And this to me is the problem I've seen all along. There are hundreds or thousands of good ideas and people who do good things out there and it doesn't add up. It doesn't scale because everyone does a good thing in its corner, there's no synergies. And I think we need to start to change all this and also that, that, that we work together and solve a problem again in, in, in the system. Um, but to, to, because there's too many good ideas that don't go anywhere because they, they, are, they are disconnected, totally disconnected from the system. And I think, in particular, the food system, you know, you cannot find anything more disconnected than the food system, almost like. Um, I will explain, <coughs> but first, I won't let go of Gates just. Oh. Um, because I, I, I can see that it, this is also, uh, it alludes to the discussion that was in the Parliament, where we had two, um, two parliamentarians from very different parties. And it looks like the goal is the same, but the means are very different. So that is the question. Um, I don't think anybody will really question uh, the good intentions of the Gates Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, but the means is a particular kind of means, of course. And that's a question I think is, I don't think we, we should, we, anybody should question sort of the intention, but is that the means um, uh, that will give us a better world? Or that question is for <laughs> for anybody who, 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 who feels that sort of should we sort of hand over global health to the pharmaceutical industry funded by the big corporations, or should we do other in something else? So we do this. Uh, I mean, we can easily show that the social organisation, if we manage to mobilise people sort of from the bottom up, we can have tremendous success. <coughs> Yeah. And it's yet to be seen that the imported toilets are used in the way they are supposed to be used. So, so, so it's really a question about, I think, the means, how to, uh, to reach the, uh, the grand vision. And I, I suppose the same in Agra. I mean, Agra is, uh, has been created with a good intention to so increase food production and alleviate poverty in Africa. I mean, no doubt, I think. I mean, I don't think... I don't know. 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 I don't
but we could also, uh, as you, you have expressed, we can also improve the productivity and the environmental quality and people's income through agroecology. That's not a product to sell, which is difficult yeah. to organize. Yeah. 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 To spread yeah. the word. Yeah. 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 How come Bill Gates yeah. is so prominent when it comes to health issues? I mean, he funds the WHO probably more than any other any government on health. And so when WHO requires an NGO person to speak, it's Bill Gates or the wife that goes to speak because they're also a civil society. And uh, why are they so influential? The power of capital. So this is what is ruling the world. We talk about the system. The system depends on capital, on who controls the levers. I mean, when, when the banks trembled in 2008-2009, trillions of dollars were immediately found to, to rescue the banks. But now the climate, great climate fund, since Copenhagen 2009, yeah. how much is it? By April this year, pledges added up to only 10.2 billion US dollars. And the same by the thing is that by 2020, there will be about $100 billion per year. But the banks could, they could trillions of dollars could be found for the banks in a few weeks. No problem. And the world, the rich countries spend over $1 trillion every year in warfare. So, but when the climate is for the planet, so by helping vulnerable nations, small islands is why disappearing, then there's no money. But when it's to weapons of destruction, there is money. Financial institutions, there is money. So it's about the system. And ultimately, I think when, when our children, as younger people, become politicians and become you know, policy makers, I think the current set of policy makers are not ready to change. So we as well be working for having more problems and then preparing to, to, to replace these guys whose vision don't go beyond four years at a time. But you know, if you want to do about the gates, you know, it's really foundation. I mean, here is a man who made a lot of money with mostly, um, I said, dishonest operations or selling people something which doesn't really work, as we all know. Okay? <laughs> uh, which is only great problem. I mean, you know, look, okay. I mean, many experiences we have made with this stuff. Okay, now the same person thinks that he knows what's good for the world. He decides on his own, because I know people working there, and they keep coming in and out because after a while you don't like it, that what's good for the world. So what's good for the world, he may have good intention in his head. But I mean, to me it looks like an intelligent person, so you think a bit further than what he does. You know, now he says, all right, um, malaria. You know, today, with the money he spent on all his drugs, uh, artemisia, uh, uh, synthetic artemisinin, for example, um, and, and vaccine, we could have solved the problem. We know since almost 50 years how to get rid of malaria. The fact that one child dies today is a scandal, but the money is still going on the way. We, we have a solution. And actually, years ago, when I was in Africa running Isipe, because we developed all kinds of ways to, actually, to, to deal with the problem, at the source, removing the cause, because what he does, he makes money and he wants to make more money treating the symptom. He's never going to rid, rid of malaria by the way they want to do it. So, so, so you see, so, so it's the whole approach. They may mean well, but they, they go totally in the wrong direction. And you can see in Agra, they get the same thing. They replicate the Green Revolution, which we know and we wrote. There's a 2000 report who says that this is backwards, it doesn't work. They spend millions doing this Agra in um, uh, Kenya and um, Atta in Ethiopia. So, you know, somebody has to say, hey, no, keep your money, disappear, we'll do a, go buy yourself a yacht and disappear in the sea, because the world will be better off without that money. Frankly, I, I know, I've seen enough of it, and really, I think we need to draw a line somewhere. Marcella. Actually, it's a very good spring from where I was coming from. It's like, I think where Leonard was being very generous to say we shouldn't question the good intentions. I, I do think we... But perhaps we should question the intention because it, the intention does speak to power and to where they're directing a change. And so I was curious about the, where the panel felt on this. I, I think I, I have some sense, but I'd like to see uh, for the young people here who are looking for ways to engage in this. Uh, if we're seeing that our, our policymakers are, are at a tipping point choosing pathways that are leading towards more exploitation versus more empowerment, um, how it is that we can encourage them on the empowerment route? Because we can reframe uh, just about anything in 
terms of, uh, you know, how can we make a profit if we look at a company <coughs> who it's against their, uh, the board of directors can throw you out if you're not making a profit because that's part of the charter of the S Corp. So if you're saying, well, they're trying to decide should we hand over the decision making for public policy and public health to an entity whose primary driver isn't about the public good, it's about uh, to, to make the bottom line because that's in their charter. You know, how is it that we can encourage our policymakers as young people coming through the system to, to do the right things? It might not be that we have enough time to groom ourselves to become members of parliament before that. <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe that we need to agitate a little sooner. So um, it, do you have a, you know, all of you can speak to this, certainly our, our, our laureates, but also our scholars from Lund and here from SEI. Uh, is there ways that you can see that we can help tip the balance towards empowerment-based policies that get to the rights-based approach as opposed to the exploitive group that really commoditizes and looks for opportunities to continue bad ideas? That was an easy question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> What's the role of science? I mean, I mean uh, to answer your question, I want to say that obviously it's a first step. It's people voting is important. But then I, I look at some selections like the UK and, and I think that's not looking good for us. Um, and, and I suspect I mean, part of, of the issue is as well that uh, it is what are the capacities that we have uh, in terms of, of having our voice heard and how does our individual vote counter against huge lobbying movements that are funding a lot of these uh, politicians, their campaigns and so forth. So at the end of the day I am cynical about what way that we change policies through our politicians. Um, I think we have to look beyond the sort of regular ideas of nation state politics uh, in, in what we do and how we collectively mobilize. I think there are ways to get our voice heard that doesn't have to be just through that avenue. Um, and I think things like your answer, your question about what the science do is, is yeah, who are we working with? Uh, how are we working, firstly, with other people, um, not just science with scientists and, and other scientists and then other scientists, but how are we really engaging um, at a very grassroots level, at a very policy level, and really getting into those discussions, which we tend to, or many people involved in research tend to stand a bit aside from it, to offer some kind of false objectivity. And actually, I think that's an illusion. It is a very normative issue. We have to be normative and take a stance on these things. And that's where critically, then we need to take a position and then participate with people in the struggle because I think it is very much a struggle um, that we have. Yeah? <laughs> yeah, I'll have to hit it up there. It's, uh, you can make economic arguments that can sometimes kind of scratch decision makers that they can save this much or they can reduce dependency for you know, foreign currency that you don't need to import if you manage your local resources better. And getting those numbers in a scientifically valid way, with all these co-benefits that can be created, I mean, they can also be interesting. But also getting examples on the ground at a scale that is powerful enough to speak to, to the decision makers. And that's difficult because we usually work on such a small scale, the decision makers say that, well, it's very small, I want to see big to be able to, to dare to take a decision. So that, Again, it's also a scale, scale trouble. How to, how to make an example that can either grow organically or be powerful enough for decision makers to, to, to support it or enable it to grow. Because it's not we're struggling with that next step. An interesting question is, of course, also if, if we sort of um, generalize a little bit, saying that there are two paths. So we have sort of the, the mainstream, which is now. Um, epitomized by the uh, program like Agra, funded by funded by by major uh, private foundation. That is one path, and then we have agroecology as another path. Can they coexist? Can we sort of um, promote both in order to reach the goal quicker, or are they actually incompatible with each other? I think this is uh, perhaps an interesting question for for scientific communities.
What do you say, Hans? You are definitely in the agroecology part. They are incompatible because the, 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 the Agra, uh, Ata and others uh, promote the use of fertilizer. They are building right now, I don't know, how many X number of fertilizer plants in, in uh, Ethiopia, in Kenya too, in Tanzania. They promote uh, uh, not only gem, but uh, hybrid seeds, which narrows the genetic diversity, makes those plants more, uh, um, and uh, those crops more uh, likely to be affected by uh, diseases because the single genome. So, so we, as we reduce genetic diversity, we increase the risk and reduce the resilience. So, I mean, so, so in, in agroecology, you just do the other way. You do more diversity, uh, you bring uh, more people into the whole process of research, participatory research, so everybody's participating, and you localize your system much more. So, to me, it looks like we know from all the evidence we have, you know, what is sustainable, what is not sustainable. Um, but, but the problem comes actually from uh, where is the money coming from? As long as agroecology, uh, organic, uh, we'll get only maybe two, three percent of the national budget for agricultural <coughs> research, whereas the other way it goes, the other gets all the, the, the money. You, you can't change the system. You, you need to, to have good science. And if, if governments more and more sort of get out of funding ag research and any other research for that matter, leave it to the private sector, say, oh, we have no money. We cannot, well, we already have enough costs with education, I don't know what. So now for research, private sector actually is interested in paying funding research because they're going to make a business out of it. And that's why we are moving in the wrong direction. Not that every business, not every um, um, company um, is bad, but I think that we are run right now by a very few number of companies, at least in the food sector, um, which and is great anti they go in the wrong direction. So, I, mean, I don't think you, I'm yet to see, you know, uh, a, a, a large company, you know, with global reach, which is uh, ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, not uh, 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 talking about the large company, something that just came to my mind. Uh, I wanted to some, ask something else first, but um, you could just seem to say with that. Isn't there the, the issue that we have, like on national level, we can do something about companies? I, that's from what I heard in the yeah. afternoon. But on the global scale, we can't because there is simply no mechanism to supervise them, basically. So a company that, organizes, that operates on a global scale, they can shift their headquarters wherever they want to, they can go to the Cayman Islands to avoid taxes, whatever they can do. Um, isn't there, like, I'm not an uh, international relations uh, specialist in any way, but like from everything that I understand of international relations, we have a very much power-based approach, to, which is very traditional, it was like started 80, 90, 100 years, if not even earlier, years ago. Um, and we still organize by that, by having countries organized by power. The U.S. is the perfect example. They are, to some extent, ruling some parts of the world because they're the most powerful country at the moment. Um, and this goes for companies as well, because they are so powerful because there is no mechanism to supervise them. Um, having that identified, is there, um, and I know that I'm addressing because that's not, not, I don't think, any of your specialties, but is there a way of finding this institution? You talked about bringing Monsanto in front of the International Court for Justice, which for me is an interesting thing. Not because I really believe that something big will come out of it, but you're taking the initiative and something will happen because it will get into media. Mm. So I would like to hear if there is an opinion on your side. We'll like to hear it. I mean, I would firstly just question your assumption that countries can control companies. Um, that certainly is not true. I mean, there are companies who are taking countries to court and preventing them from having certain policies uh, because it goes against rules, their trade rules. Um, and in terms of a supervisory overseeing of company, uh, of course that exists. Um, the World Trade Organization and other institutions that are about bilateral and multilateral trade are doing that. It's just, why would we assume that they are working in any interest but the interest of how corporations operate, which is to maximize profit. Um, so with that in mind, this vision role is to continue to open markets um, and continue to grow trade. And so that's not the kind of supervisory role we need to have. I, I think that we need to really rethink how much power that we have given to these corporations um, and, you know, there's been discussions about do we need a world environment organization or a world sustainability organization. I'm not sure that that's going to be any more powerful than a world trade organization. But then it comes to a question of 
do we think that the solutions, and it comes again to with good interest idea, uh, will lie within the status quo, what currently exists, <coughs> the market as we currently operate it? And I, I think it's fundamentally incompatible. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, uh, I will just follow up about so, so Who's actually the one that oh. we had law and order here, so he's actually <laughs> the one that's behind you. Thank you for giving me this chance. And uh, I'm originally from Ethiopia, and I work at this year. So now you mentioned Ethiopia and fertilizer and things like that. But you know, in Sahara Africa, the fertilizer application is less like 10 kilograms per hectare, which is very small. And people are already hungry now, and the plan is to lift the fertilizer a little bit. Like it's like one tenth of what we put here in Europe or in the US, and it's already low. And the aim is just to lift it a little bit. And that's just to feed an already hungry people. So we are talking future generation, sustainability, versus generation today. So how you see feeding people today and maybe feeding the people in the future. And perhaps maybe the fertilizer application may not have that effect for the environment, for that matter, because it's already low. So how can you reflect on that? <coughs> you know, it doesn't matter what Europe does or America does on fertilizer. The question is, is your soils, what is the problem with those soils? It, it's not a matter of compare, comparing with anything, right? I mean, that, that's the number one. I hear this all the time. Oh, we use only a tenth of what they do in Europe, so we're okay. Actually, the fact that they use any fertilizer here is wrong to begin with. And particularly the nitrogen fertilizer we're talking about, which, which is the big mix in the whole thing, which makes the matter and eventually more susceptible to diseases, to bugs. So it creates only problem. And there is evidence. We have shown this. I've spent 27 years in Africa in research, in agriculture. We, we can treble, quadruple, or more the, 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 uh, the return on, on land, on farms, not only just the yield, okay, with the productivity of a farm, um, by applying organic, uh, sustainable agricultural uh, uh, practices. And uh, what you do, you not only produce more yield, but actually you have better quality, you use farmers' uh, varieties, you start to, to uh, mix your crops, you, produce, you can produce your own nitrogen fertilizer, you produce fodder, then you have manure, which comes back onto the land, and so you can improve your soils. I mean, again, there's you, you look at Joe Spritty, he published uh, like 280 uh, studies across Africa where at least the production has been doubled, again, without the use of fertilizer. So, you know, there's this thing in this mindset, oh, we need that. But actually, you, what you need to do is to change the practices, the paradigm of agriculture. Because using fertilizer, even a little bit, it gets you off the track of doing the right thing. So, so, so and we know it, there's enough examples. Um, I've been in Ethiopia many times, we're supporting projects there too, so it can be done, it's been done so many times. But somehow, there's all these forces out there, in the particular the Yara group and, and a few others, who, who, who will deny that actually you can do it without. And so, so, so that's the problem. And uh, again, if I had done it myself, so I wouldn't say this, but, but I've been there long enough with enough experience uh, to tell you that it is possible. And actually, it's for the better. So, um, you know, it's so a pesticide. We don't need any. One of the other arguments has been that the world will soon get to 9 billion people. How can you feed them? But also researchers have shown that right now, there's enough food to feed 12 billion. Yeah, right now. To feed 12 billion right now. So what is 9 billion? It's about who has access to the food. What is the food being used for? I have to keep the voice now too. I know, and I need to get to the airport too. <laughs> 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 Not to mention. <laughs> you know, um, I continue on that track, so to speak. Uh, I'm wondering about the urban dimension, because I think often uh, when uh, agriculture is brought up, it's just brought up as a question for the country. So. And I think the only times it sort of filters down to urban people is sort of, okay, you use the market mechanism, you search for little labels on the packages, and then it often boils down to, well, organic agriculture is costly, you, it, it's, it needs to be expensive, blah, 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 so you just go that route. And you need to intensify production because that saves forestry and cutting down, so that's 
environmentally friendly, and, and that's the story we we're hearing in like urban places. So I'm just wondering, uh, like, what ways are there currently to try to like filter down <laughs> alternative discourse to urban population? Uh, an easy question. <laughs> and, uh, an easy answer in in two minutes. <laughs> I mean, if, if I can just make a very, two very quick points. One is that what's wrong with urban agriculture? Why aren't we doing that more? There's certainly opportunities to grow food in cities and, and connect people more with nature. And then two, I think the biggest crisis we have is a culture of uh, a crisis of our imagination. We can't think behind, beyond what we have currently. And if we're able to do that, we actually set the boundaries free to come up with these alternative solutions. Two minutes. <laughs> Crisis of imagination. <laughs> I'm going to write that down. Okay, thank you for an excellent sort of final remark, and uh, and uh, this question needs to be discussed a bit. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, in the program, it says that I'm supposed to do some summing up, but uh, um, in the interest of time and also. Um, Sort of the hanging questions, I refrain from any summing up. So I would just like to, to thank the sort of, um, excellent panel and uh, the audience for being here. And um, I'm looking forward to having more of these, <coughs> these collaborations because I, I, I feel that there is, there is a difference in how we, different sort of institutions, even different research institutions, how we focus, how we address what we think about problems and, and, and solutions. And so, for example, SEI is a place for linking science and policy, uh, while at Luxus we are primarily interested in linking, not linking science and activism, but understanding more how we can uh, promote change because of the inefficiency uh, of policy. Policy is simply uh, um, in, in, in the field of environment, policy is sort of stored. We, 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 we need to have other mechanisms of change, and that's why we are particularly interested in things like social movements, um, um, various forms of mobilizing grassroots as mechanisms of, of change. And uh, I, I, I think it's, we can have a fruitful dialogue in the future. Yeah.